Hi, I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm president and CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and welcome to another session of uh, SOAP Video. Um, probably one of the things that uh, our members ask is, uh, I have an idea, so what do I do with it? I mean, how do I get it to a patient? What's involved? How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Who are the people I need to know? Et cetera, et cetera. So um, we've put together uh, a three video series to answer your questions. And uh, I'm pleased to have as our special uh, guest uh, and presenter, Brian Doty. Hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Um, Brian, can you uh, introduce yourself to the uh, members? Sure, well, it's great to be here. It's my favorite uh, subject in life. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Um, I started off at large companies. I was actually in uh, tech, IT, if you will, at the very beginning of my career. But then I found healthcare, came up through the ranks at J&J &J and Medtronic. And then I had three straight, what we're talking about today, ideas to development, to FDA approval or clearance and exit, three in a row. And there they are, Fox Hollow, Echoes and Cardiovascular Systems. Um, two of those we took public, I have about 2.5 billion market cap, one we sold and that product is currently with Boston Scientific. Um, when I had my last exit, Cardiovascular Systems, I started Delta Force uh, in 2013, and it was strictly to do what we're talking about today uh, on this video and subsequent next two Tuesdays. And that is help clinicians, engineers, people with ideas to get through this system and be successful. Uh, the system we're gonna talk about is vetting scoring, funding your project, developing it, commercializing it, and hitting the exit. So that's me. Great. So how do you get an idea to a patient? Well, it's a really interesting uh, journey. I can say that there's been no two uh, the same. So in addition to the exits that I've done in my group, we have a collective 19 exits and studying them and many others that won and lost. Uh, the answer is no, there's not one answer, Arlen. And what I hope to do today is show a process that regardless of what space you're in, what stage you're in, that you can pull risk out of it. You can add predictability to your win uh, to the program. So there's no one answer to that, unfortunately. But there is a process that you can fall back on that's proven fundamentals. Great, so why don't you walk us through the process? Okay, it'd be a pleasure. So um, as we mentioned, this is a six part program. We're gonna do two in each series, this being the first one. Today, I'm gonna to do just what you asked, Arlen. I'm gonna give the process in general. How do you do this? How do you succeed? And then we'll also in this session talk about how do you vet it like NASA? And I think we'll have some fun with that. So, you know, I first have to give you a little background. And when you ask the question, well, how do you do this if you're a doctor or an engineer? Well, first of all, you have to be aware of what is it like today, because how we did this 20 years ago is different than 10 years ago, and that's different than today. So I'm going to give you a quick background on that. And I'm going to show you the process, just kind of an A to Z. One thing that Arlen and I talk about a lot is we don't want this to just be generalities. Uh, there's too many generalities, case studies. You can learn from them. Don't get me wrong. We want to make this actionable. So whatever you don't get doing this uh, live, you know, follow up with us, because we want you to be armed, uh, weaponized to make your idea come to market. And then the second part of today is I'll show you the most important step of the answer, how do I do this, which is vetting scoring. So just real quick history lesson, because it's very important that you have this background. I know if you go to medical school, you, you learn the history of all of these procedures right up to the current day. That's a little bit what this is like. So here we go. Somebody has an idea, doctor, entrepreneur, engineer, investor, somebody has an idea. And the way we used to do it is you'd go to angel investors, friends and family angels, and you'd get some money and you'd acquire some space. You know, you rent some office space, some lab space. Then you'd start to acquire equipment. You'd hire some development engineers. Got to have a regulatory person. Usually by now you need more money, which makes your first group usually not so happy, but you need more money. And then typically we would just start to hire people, build the infrastructure. And these are some of the roles that we would hire, full-time people. And then we would have to go to a series A, more significant money and giving up significant um, parts of the company in terms of equity. 
We usually would get additional space, hire more people, manufacturing, uh-oh, raise another round. And then we would go for clinical, receive our clearance, another round, so we could get the sales force to commercialize it. And then ultimately you'd get an exit. And this is the way it worked for years, uh, but then it changed. So the result of how it used to work, if you look at on the left column, failure rate, how many rounds of funding, uh, what's the total investment? At Cardiovascular Systems Inc., before we got public and built enough float in the stock, we had $120 million in that company. And then there was this sort of today column over on the far right. We started to get a little smarter. Maybe we don't need all these full-time people. Maybe we can get some part-times. Maybe we can get some consultants. Um, maybe we could be smarter about leasing equipment versus buying it. So it is still the case, though, that in the glory days, you know, when you come down to here in the middle column, about two years, literally, you would most often be acquired as soon as you made it through FDA clearance. Well, that changed. My run at Cardiovascular Systems Inc. was eight years before I could get an exit from that. Um, if you look at what's similar from glory days to today, still huge failure rates five rounds of funding and think about the dilution all the early investors have. The average investment is lower today than it was because we're a little smarter. We have less full-time people. We burn a little bit less cash. But what's really different is the bottom. They used to want to acquire, I'm talking about strategics, acquiring companies. The mentality, and I know because I did these jobs, the mentality was let's find something early before they've unlocked significant value in the idea, the product, whatever it was. We wanna get it early. And that is definitely different today. Today, they would much rather wait for you to prove in the market that this is a winning idea and they're willing to pay more. It's not a secret, they will wait. They want it no risk practically. So these are some of the changes from glory days to today. But if you look at it- so before, Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Oh no, do you have- no, I was gonna say, what are, so why did this happen? This happened because people did all their focus over on the right. The focus was, I have an idea. And all of the time and money went into getting it through the FDA process. So people weren't thinking like we're going to show today how we would recommend you to do this. They're not thinking the way we do it now, which I'm going to come to. They All the focus and time and money was, let's get it cleared. Why? That was the end zone. You could usually be purchased once you got cleared. So things were done in a serial fashion, idea, prototype, test the prototype. You're marching your way along. They weren't doing it the way we would do it now, which I'm going to save for another slide. But this is the big point on this slide is over to the right. Doing it the way you did it over to the right, what happened was so many devices that were purchased by acquirers, strategics failed that the mentality flipped. Don't try to get it early because we are failing so often. And now it is wait until you're more sure so that you fail less. That's the answer. Okay, so um, just a couple of highlights that I pointed out there of what's really was different from glory days to today. But now there's been another evolution and here's what it looks like. Um, we've talked about glory days and today, here's what's emerging now. And going back to your question, Arlen, look to the top right. It used to be, as I mentioned, we focus on getting clearance. Now, you must focus on two paths. Clearance is still definitely important, but you need to focus and worry about and think about its commercial value just as much as what you used to do thinking about getting it cleared. In other words, is this going to be acquired? Is it going to make it into a patient? And unfortunately, when we do our scoring vetting, we look at 217 individual components of this package. And only about 35, 36 of them have anything to do with the device or the disease state you're trying to help. Everything else is calculus around its commercial value. So what's really different now is we do much more fractional uh, all the way from the beginning to the commercialization, but we're thinking from day one, what is the commercial value of the project? And it's kind of sad in a way because there's plenty, so many good ideas. It's rare that a doctor brings me an idea that I don't say humanity needs that, but that's not the question. The question of how you get it into a patient really is, does it have commercial value? So more to come on that, unless there are any questions. Okay, 
last thing to say about the background, uh, I say that it's time to innovate innovation. We have to develop these different. And when I say develop these projects different, I mean, we have to think about it from the beginning differently to, to pull risk forward, to decrease the, the failures, to increase the probability of success. And here's what happened as a result of doing it the old way. We have record amounts of capital available. I'm speaking about the US. We have record investment in med tech, but it's not in device. Majority of it is not in device. It's harder than ever to raise money in device. We're at a record low of medical device investments as a matter of fact. So the implications are, it's gonna be difficult to raise capital, not impossible, difficult. Why? Because of all the failures that have happened. You know, if someone came to me back in my younger day and they say, hey, this uh, particular doctor is coming out with a new, I don't know, coronary stent or a new catheter across chronic total occlusion, we would invest in that company. Why? Good chance it's going to be purchased as soon as it's cleared, not now. So investors are looking at it now, not just what's its clinical value, but as I mentioned, what's its commercial value? So here's the process. Here's the overview, kind of A to Z in today's world. By the way, when you're consuming this, I'm never going to say, I bet you you'll never hear from me something where you would sit there and say, wow, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. The question won't be, have you thought of this? The question to bear in mind during this video is, are you doing it? And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So it's not rocket science, but it is hard work. Good news is it's pretty black and white. So let's dig in. Here's the process. It starts with benchmarking or scoring. Uh, when I say benchmark, I mean looking at the space you're thinking about, looking at what companies are there now, looking at startups that have won or failed. You need to benchmark your idea against them. This is the most important step. Unfortunately, the majority of deal flow that comes to me, somebody's already pretty far down the road, has spent quite a bit of money and time. And unfortunately, if I look at it and score it, vast majority of them, I would have advised them from the beginning, don't do it. The next big batch I advise is I would say, I'm glad you should do it, but you're going about it wrong. Maybe your cost of goods is trending, it's not gonna work. Maybe the technique you're introducing to the procedure is so different that adoption will be hard. The bottom line here is you must do diligent, and I'll show you how, benchmarking. And again, it's not just the clinical. In fact, as I mentioned, a small part of your scoring benchmarking has to do with clinical. So anyway, we benchmark it, score it. Should you do it? Next, you go for the investment. This is so hard now because VCs have largely exited medical device. Angels have been diluted so many times that even if they had wins, they barely made money. Uh, it's harder to get the money. So we started our own fund so that when we find one that scores well, benchmarks well, we'll fund it. But they're out there. I'm going to show you how to do that in the second series. But so you benchmark it, should you do it? Invest it, and then you develop and gain clearance for sure. But look at number four. We go into this now planning to commercialize. And my definition of commercial isn't get it ready to go to the market. My definition of commercialization is you are in the market selling it. You're proving to that potential acquirer how accretive it might be in their particular sales bag. That means I'm measuring, I'm giving data to this acquirer, potential acquirer. What's the average selling price I can hold? What is my reorder rate? How long does it take me to get through the hospital or integrated delivery network, company that own hospitals? But A to Z, this is the process. It never used to be so hard to raise money, but it's doable. Almost nobody even today does the benchmarking scoring appropriately. And most people fear commercialization. I'm here to say that that is one of the four legs of the chair. You must plan to commercialize. Otherwise you'll either A, never exit, or if you do, you'll be giving it away because you haven't proven the value. So these are the steps that we're gonna talk about in more detail, but that's the overview. Any questions or keep going, Arlen? Um. I, Sudhakar, you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, so ex excellent, uh, excellent view, Brian. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you came from tech as well. So I can, I can probably understand it. <laughs> um, the, the question is, are you defining software as a medical device within 
the scope of how you're laying this out here or is that a different beast altogether? And is the investment in software as a medical device, which I thought was pretty nascent and very new, is that going to follow the same trajectory if you think it is different? Right, are you, are you saying software and medical device or digital? Software as a medical device. Software yeah. as a medical device, very medical good device. question. Right. Um, what and I would say actually, is- And actually to put, a, to put a finer point on it, medical device these days has, I mean, we used to call it med tech and now we call it tech med. I mean, essentially medicine has become a data industry that happens to take care of patients. I don't care whether it's a drug or a device or software or AI or blank as a whatever. So the question is, now that there is a collision or coherence of digital health with device, whether it's AI, whether it's software, whether it's remote sensing, whether it's embedded implants, is that what is that included in your process? Exactly. Or is it a different beast? No, it's the same. It's the same and it's even more critical. Now, three, four, five years ago, uh, it was a little different because so much money was coming to it. It was almost like a bubble that was growing. Oh, digital, AI, digital and healthcare. It started with big data in hospitals and trying to AI that. And now it's all the way into wearables that are talking through a software algorithm, uh, advising the patient on what to do or not. So a lot of those companies that attracted that money early, it's been exciting, but a lot of them have failed. So now I would say it exactly matches this the same way as a traditional medical device. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Any other any other questions? We have a relatively small group, which is the good news. So if you have a question, just put it in the chat, and I'll call on you. Okay. So let's move on. So I'll go to a couple more. So that's it, A to Z. And what I find too often is that the doctor has the idea, and then focuses on building prototypes and testing it to see is it doing what they thought? Is it going to solve the unmet need that usually is in the space or the specialty they're in? Uh, most of the time, they're not thinking about this four-step process. Uh, so there it is in a nutshell. This is a big takeaway slide to think about for anyone that's going forward. Let's go into a little more detail now. I'm going to start off with the vetting scoring. So remember, it's step one down at the bottom left. And here's the trick. When you vet this correctly, score it. And this, I use a scoring system. I mentioned 217 points. By the way, I don't have 217 points I'm going to vet or score because I want to, over the years of being a student of this, being in this, both at big companies and small, it arrived at 217. In other words, you might be strong on 210 of them, and those seven you're not can be the deal breaker. So it, it grew to that because all of these factors matter. The great news is when you do this, you don't just get a yes, no, should I go forward? It delivers a roadmap. It'll tell you exactly what must be true per history for you to actually get it to the patient and exit. So let's talk about how we do this. This is going to sound a little bit, um, I don't know, I don't want to sound like arrogant or braggadocious at all, but believe it or not, if somebody comes to me, doesn't matter who it is, some titans of their industry, of their specialty have come to me. Some people that have had multiple exits come to me and still my advice is the same. Stop. Wherever you are, thinking about a startup, midway through a startup, uh, ready to commercialize, I still say stop, stop everything. And, and here's why. You've got to, no matter what stage you're in, do this scoring because it stipulates what must be true from the beginning or whatever stage you're in. And then go with much more information and a higher likelihood of success. So here's, here's the scoring. Essentially what it is, is you're trying to take things that are subjective and make them objective. You're trying to pull as much risk in this endeavor forward and deal with it early as possible. You have all these inputs I already mentioned, but this has been validated. Like I've studied this and been through this many times. And what it delivers is kind of a measure of where you are. And then it gives you this guide that I mentioned. So it's very important because it helps with your decision-making, et cetera. I'm gonna give you one example, just real quick. Here's the typical vetting today. The typical vetting today is this. All right, have my idea. Maybe I'm a doctor in that space. I know this procedure. I did, I've trained for years to do this procedure. I know that if I had this widget, that I would be able to do this procedure better, maybe faster, less expensive. So there you go. If you're not a doctor, you're from the industry side, 
you call a few doctors in that space. I'm here to tell you that if you went to Midtown Manhattan today at very well-known, very successful, either um, investment banks or VCs, and they have all these analysts, even they today, believe it or not, will call a few doctors in the space. That's not enough. The right way to do it is as follows, in my opinion. I want you to think about an Apollo launch. So think about the Apollo program and think about them in Houston and he had all these people in this control room, remember? And what would they do before they hit go, before they launched? They would go around the room. They're talking to guidance, engines, fuel systems, right? All the way around. And what are they saying? Go, guidance, go, right? Go, go, go. Here's where you need to go from the beginning or wherever you are in your process. These are the stakeholders. And this is why it's 217 scores. For sure, you're gonna to wanna to talk to key opinion leaders. These are people that can move the market. These are people that other doctors look up to. They see them on the podium, they read their papers. No brainer, gotta do it. High volume doctors. These can be different than the key opinion leaders. There are doctors that I go to that are high volume. They will look at these cases differently than maybe a key opinion leader. Here's an example. If your product comes in and it's beautiful clinically, but it slows them down, your uptake is gonna be affected by that. If this is done be, being done in your case in an office-based lab, that high volume doctor has one of those. And if you're not suitable for that environment, even though you're suitable for the hospital, that will hurt you. So just a couple of quick examples. Here's the rest of the players. I've had plenty of products where everything is good to go, but the integrated delivery network, the companies that own hospitals, look, it used to be hospital decided yes or no, the doctor can have it, your new thing. Then it was GPOs and now it's IDNs. And so there are plenty of times where your product should be perfect, but they won't let you into their 2000 hospitals because they have a contract with somebody who makes what you're trying to replace. So the IDN input matters. The payers for sure, Medicare, privates, but now how about the funders? Early on, go to the funders and let's see if you're fundable. And VC, I still get their input, even though they don't invest much, but lately it's high net worth, family office, sure angels are still around, but then SPACs. So are you fundable? I want input. I will score your fundability. Just the same that I'll score every one of these boxes so far. So then the just, hospital- just so, Excuse me, just so people know, uh, define a SPAC. They, everyone may not know what that is. Yeah, so these are special funds where people go out and they raise the money for a company that's going to be someday. So it's public, people are investing in it, and they're counting on the people running that SPAC to pick the right things to put into the company. So instead of company goes public, this is public, and then they make a company. Right. It's a it's a form of a, what's called a reverse merger, and it's a special purpose acquisition company. There's been a lot of press and if you're following the Wall Street Journal or your local newspaper, there's a big bubble in SPACs. And from an investor perspective, they're becoming already suspect just because of the nature of the model. And some feel it's a bubble, but you'll see a lot of chatter about SPACs. Thank you, Arlen. Where I do see them really exciting right now, and, and I still think a lot of potential is in the digital slash software, by the way. So more to come on that. Um, why would I bother talking to the hospital staff? I had one two years ago. Doctors loved it. Economics were good. Hospital purchasing loved it. Everyone was good except the hospital staff. They had, a, they had to learn and remember a bunch of steps to set this thing up and then monitor it while the doctor was using it. And it, it failed. <laughs> so these are just little examples of why these people matter. For sure, the clinical literature for sure, I start with the grants. Is there a possibility of non-dilutive funding? So that's in the scoring system. I love to talk to sales reps in the space. What do you wish you had? If you had this in your bag, what would it be like? Who, where would you start to? Why? Give me the profile of the doctor. Uh, we talked to the strategics that your potential acquires. It's amazing to me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, amazing to me that most people start their program without going to the strategic or potential acquirer first. So I hear all the time, oh, have you talked to the strategics? Oh yeah, they're interested. Okay, well, who'd you talk to? Business development? You haven't talked to anyone yet. You have to talk to who holds the P&L, the profit and loss for the division your product's gonna go to. 
And you have to find out if there's room for this in their five-year plan or is it already in their five-year plan? I'm just giving you some nuances, but isn't it amazing? I think it's amazing, at least to me, people go down all this, this work, effort, blood, sweat, tears, money, and then they go see if they can get acquired. It's just completely backwards. So strategics have to be up front. Now, developers well, let me ask you, a, if, if you don't mind, while we're at that subject, um, the question always comes up, how do you play nice with big device? And it's easy to say, oh, you just, you know, you, you need to talk to the strategics. You need to talk to the M&A people and the business development people at Medtronic. Well, it's not so easy to just pick up the phone and call the business development, you know, cardiovascular business development head at Mantronic and get a response. So how do you do that? Yeah, well, this is where I, I tend to stay in my wheelhouse, where I know these, a lot of these people for years. They know me. You have to be able to have a network relationships to get to the right people. And Arlen, it's even worse than how do you get there? Like you could LinkedIn someone try to call them, leave them a voicemail. The point is, are you getting to the right person? And if you are, are you asking the right questions? And number two, will they tell you? So there's an art just in this, and I can elaborate more to directly answer or keep going with the overview. Well, why don't, while we're on the subject, why don't you just kind of drill sure. down a little bit on that? Because I think a lot of people bump up against this and they just don't know how to sure. do it. Yeah, well, here's exactly how I, I'll just give you an example of well, yesterday. So we have one right now that we're going through the scoring, doing all the vetting, and this is in the ENT space. Okay, ENT. So that's an interesting space. I mean, it's it, however you train what you thought you were going to do as an ENT, that changed a lot in the last seven years because what they've done is take a lot of products that we would think of as vascular products, angioplasty balloons, balloons, stents, drug coated, drug eluding. A lot of those are gone into the ENT space. So we're doing one. And I'm not from ENT, but a lot of people in my network, which is primarily neurovascular, cardiovascular, and peripheral vascular, plenty of people, both industry and sales types, have gone into ENT. So the way I did it was I needed to get to three strategics in that space so I could score their appetite for this idea. So I've talked to all these people, plenty of the doctors, the reps, et cetera. Now I'm trying to get to these ENT strategics and I don't know them. So I literally started with sales reps I know that went over to ENT because they were doing balloons and stents and it was such a growing thing. Then they took me up to their friends that were in charge, you know, maybe VP level, whatever. Then you got to CEOs. And so it would just work my way through the network to people that they trust. And then I talk to them and I say, hey, already I go, here's where I've already been. Here's what I know. I show them that I'm a student of this. I'm not wasting their time. I have some very specific questions. So I use the network to get to the right people. And then I ask the questions that are intelligent questions that are telling me now, I'm not asking them in general, what do you think of the space? What do you think of the idea? I'm saying, hey, I'm working on one. Here's what it does. Here's how it's different. Here's what I think the cost of goods is. Here's its reimbursement code. Is this in your plan? What would your appetite be? What would you have to see? This is critical. Mr. or Ms. Strategic, what would you have to see, pure data from this device in the market to make your yes, no decision and how you would value it? So it's a process. And, and just so everybody knows, I'm an ENT doc. So uh, this is uh, true to my heart. Um, okay. Um, uh, so let's move on. So strategic, super important, don't wait on that. Now developers incubators, part of the new way we do it is, let me say this up front. You still might have an idea that is perfect to do it the old way. Bricks and mortar, full-time people. That's one end of this development spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, complete opposite, is to do everything fractional. And then there are four or five different processes in the middle, development choices. So it runs the gamut. And my note is to say, no one project fits into one way to do this. So there's plenty of options. The trick is matching your device and your market, your idea to the right process. Well, bigger than ever now are developers incubators. 
And there's a lot of different definitions of this. My definition is as follows. One place where you can go that you can fractionally get excellent regulatory, excellent quality system, excellent engineering, and even manufacture in-house. To me, that's an incubator and there are some really good ones out there. So anyway, wanted to tell you that you go there. Why do I go there? When I go to an incubator, like I just described, I get a chance to see, well, what do you think the regulatory path is? What do you think the development time and cost is? You know what I mean? You get to, you get to fit, kind of do scoring through the, the incubator and the incubator loves it because incubators get blamed. If your product that you hire them to do isn't successful, oftentimes you blame it on the incubator. So this helps the incubator know what they're building, why they're building it. What has to be true? Scoring system told you what had to be true. Then of course, the regulatory path, industry execs and practices. Practices is special for the question that came up earlier on digital. One big reason these digital ideas, um, working on one right now, that's for heart failure. So there's great ways to monitor the patient 24 seven now. It's really nice if the data from that monitoring instrument goes to an algorithm that can kick out to the doctor, your particular patient is um, about to form a blood clot that could be a stroke. So everything lines up that you should see this patient now. Okay, great. That A device like that, a wearable with software algorithm. The failure point there is it doesn't fit in the practice. It's like the practice is running like a bicycle wheel with spokes and they have that thing running the way it works, the way everyone gets served well, the way they can stay open, pay their bills. And now sometimes you bring these digital software things in and it's so disruptive to the practice that you didn't plan for that. And so you get like resistance. So practices matter as well. Kind of like how the hospital staff matters. How does it work in the practice? Educating the patient on a new thing, how you, how you bill it, how you book it, all of these things. Will the staff support what you're trying to do? And we learned this the hard way in interventional cardiology, by the way, when they started to do peripheral vascular. Uh, it was even their own partners that weren't doing peripheral sometimes gave them so much static that it was difficult for us to get traction. So point here is simple. This is the part, this is the slide that when you take your idea, consider these stakeholders. It's not that you haven't thought of them. Most people don't actually do the work to go to each one of these and get their input so you can make good decisions. Anyway, when you're scoring it, if you can get like the Apollo launch a go from all of these, then you have a pretty good chance of success. So you do it before you start and you do this uh, pulsing, polling of these folks, these stakeholders every step of the way. Um, that's the biggest part right there. So when you do it, you end up with a scorecard and you can make this, this is an Excel sheet. Just ask the question, decide what you're gonna give a score. What's a 10, what's a seven, what's a four, what's a one? Nice little force choice separation and just populate your sheet and see what you end up with. The answer of should you go forward will be on the sheet you make. The answer of how to go forward will be on the sheet you made as well. So you're looking at the market, the unmet needs, the exit potential, what has to be true of the solution, are you fundable, and can you commercialize it? So that's a nice, between the last slide and this one, that, that is the essence of the first step, which is scoring. So you can win in this new era, for sure. I was on the phone yesterday with a friend of mine, he arrived at this company one year ago, April, one year ago, just sold it to Merck for 225 million. I mean, it happens every day. Uh, so don't be put off. You have to know that what you're getting into, you have to be prepared to do this scoring. And anyway, it's not hard. It's just takes time and effort. And it's really helpful if you have the right network to get to these people, kind of what Arlen was asking about. So anyway, you score it out and uh, I'm going to show you the same thing I've been saying on this call so far. I'm going to show you one more way. So the best chance of success, bar none, is to start with an unmet clinical need in a hot space. Stroke's an example of a hot space. Women's health care or sick care is an example of a hot space. Best is that you have on purpose with full intentionality to go after an unmet need. This is more rare. Almost always somebody first says, what's, what's my idea? I have an idea. Let's run with it. 
Um, it's not the best way, but you can still win. So then before you do anything, ask yourself, what is your end game? Are you doing this because you have such a passion for this particular procedure or this particular disease state that you want to see this fixed? That's a great motivation, by the way, because it'll keep you in the game on days that you start to lower your chin, it keeps your chin up, it keeps you going. But for some people, it might be, I want to exit this. I want to put no more than five or 10 million in. I want to sell it for 60 and I want to make some money and do some good. doesn't matter. There's no judgment on your why, but you have to know it before you start because you're going to make decisions every single day in this process. And, and the yes to choose this or choose that often goes right back to why are you starting it? And I'm amazed today how many times I say, well, what's, what's the end goal? What, what's your exit? Oh, we haven't thought about it. We're going to build it for value and see what we No. You have to know what you want out of this. It's very important. Okay, so then you vet it and score it, like we've been talking about today. Then you get your first investment. These days, you'll take a fractional investment, a seed investment. We can get very far down the road if we have good scoring up front and a good idea of what we want for an exit. We can get very far down the road with a fractional investment. Then I like fractional development. Again, my note was, there's some where we'll go right for bricks and mortar and full-time people. More often, it's a fractional. I'm not going to spend money and burn cash on full-time people that I don't need full-time. Usually, what I need is an absolute expert in exactly what I'm talking about, and I need a part of their time. That's where incubators can be very helpful. So when I do a fractional in this process, very often for the amount of money at the top right, we will get through phase one feasibility and even validation and verification and get a clearance and be ready for limited market release. Typically from there, we'll fractionally commercialize that. A session coming up, two sessions from now, we're gonna dig into what that means and exactly how to do it. And then usually we can exit now one to three years. It's not the average, this is a different model. Cost less, it's faster. Why? Why is it more successful, cost less than faster? Because of the system that we're running, starting with the vetting and scoring and knowing what your end game or exit is uh, what you want it to be. So the takeaways are, yes, the environment, the market, the system of how you do this has changed dramatically in my career. If you do that deep scoring from the beginning and every step of the way, you just stack the odds in your favor considerably. And then if you follow a system like we're talking about that learns from successes and failures from the past right up to the present day, you can get your ideas to patients. And that's what I had prepared. Great. Um, so again, if uh, people in the audience have some uh, questions um, and if you wanna stop sharing your slide, that's- Sure. Uh, um, so how do people get the scoring system from you or can they? Is it proprietary? Do they have to pay for it? Do they have to hire you? How do you get the system? Okay, well, two things to say about that. First, uh, I built this system and validated over 25 years. It's constantly updated because I learned something new and I see how does it affect the system. So you can come to me and we will vet it. You can come to our fund and we will vet it, but you don't have to. It's not rocket science. If you take just these slides that you have, it will take time, it will take effort. It will be hard if you don't have the network. It'll be less successful if you're asking the questions because you haven't seen all the ways they might answer. I'll give you one example real quick. So one day I'm in an interventional cardiology lab. It's six o'clock in the morning. The doctor has the um, resident uh, getting the common femoral access. We're in the, extra, the reading room, the uh, angio reading room and a call's coming in, and a call's coming in from a strategic. And they're calling this high volume doctor to ask some questions. Hey, what do you think about this? We did that. And it was amazing. I'm talking about the point of, are you educated, experienced enough to, to hear these questions and ask them? So the strategic's asking these questions and the doctor's answering. I'm sitting right there, it's on speakerphone. And I hear this doctor answering almost the opposite of what I see them do in the lab every day. And so I'm looking at this doctor and he goes like this to me, finishes the call. And I go, hey, um, you know, he knew I was gonna ask. I'm like, those things you said, that's not how you do it. 
And he goes, oh yeah, I know. They're gonna do a big study. I wanna be the PI. Uh, I'm gonna you know, tell them what they wanna hear. That goes on. So the point is, you, if you have the right network, if you know what to ask, you can do very well. But even if you don't, with good old fashioned stick to just work the system as I've outlined it. Get those stakeholders, ask them what you need to know for your project. So you can absolutely do it yourself. We call what we do force multiplication. Like we have the best trained, best equipped military in the world. Why then do we need SEAL teams, special forces teams, Rangers? It's because there's a time we're in a place for force multiplication, special skills, special effort. So faster, better chance of success if you go with people who know how to vet this, but you can do it yourself for sure. I showed you the stakeholders, go find out what you need to know. Okay. Now, so basically um, what I call what you've just described is be a problem seeker at first, not a problem solver. You need to understand the problem and the people who have the problem, because as you've indicated, there are too many solutions looking for a problem. And if I had to pick one thing that people do wrong, is they start with the solution, not the problem. And understanding the problem takes a long time. And you got to talk to all these people and mm -hmm. all the issues that you've enumerated. And the second little phrase I use is to be motivated to do this, you have to make it personal, but not take it personally. Mm. If it's not personal, you're going to fail because there's just too many roadblocks and you're not going to be able to overcome them. You're not going to have the motivation, but there's a pretty good chance you're going to fail. And if you do, you don't take it personally. You just learn from the mistake, go back, do it over again. And if you're personally intrinsically motivated, then it's more likely you'll be successful. So I want to ask another question, and that is uh, that in the initial analysis, uh, I, you probably included, but it wasn't in the slide, uh, it, there wasn't uh, intellectual property. So this issue always comes up with, I don't want to tell my secret sauce to big data, big tech, big device, big whatever, because they're going to steal my idea. So when someone says, well, tell me about your idea, and you say, ah, I need, you need to sign an NDA. You need, to send, you need to sign a confidentiality agreement. No one's going to sign that. No investor is going to sign that. So when you get that question, how do you deal with that? Okay, so I heard two things in there, the NDA and the IP. So the IP, I, I have no, I don't do one thing about IP. I call attorneys that I know, IP specialists, not just in general, in that space. So I go to my go-to guys and I say, here's the space. And it's always for me, you know, neuro, cardio, peripheral, almost always. And then I have them, okay, who's the right person? I don't want to pay someone to go learn the space. I need someone that's like me. I know 28 years of nuance in this space. I need that IP person. So I go get it. That's number one. NDAs, no investor signs NDAs as you outlined. Strategics do. And how do you um, prevent? So, you know, the old, the old story was you go to a trade show, you go to a, a medical meeting and there's 200 vendors on the floor. You go to the American, the American College of Cardiology meeting, there's 50,000 cardiologists there, there's 200 vendors, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And uh, everyone is sort of approaching the director of sales and marketing for company X, yeah. a doctor, and say, well, here's my idea. And they sketch it out on a napkin and they slide it across the table. And the next thing you know, they never hear from these people again, but a year and a half later, they see the, pro the product. So is that in fact true? And if so, how do you prevent it? Okay, well, there are stories like that. More common, more common is that the strategics going to their, um, let's say influential trusted clinician and they're giving them free advice. They're, they're like, oh, I would do this, right? Put a bend on it and they don't get anything for it. And that's not right, but it happens all the time. So that's sort of the piece at a time. And the doctor doesn't even realize it. He's like, yeah, here's what I would do. You're asking me to give you a quick answer, quick question, quick answer. So more common is that. It does happen where people are afraid that their idea is gonna get out. So. It has to do with when you put provisional patents 
and when you go for full patents. People really only are going to get the, the real story through the patents. So for me, if I'm concerned at all, I get an NDA. And I don't go to the investors and tell everything. Like if it's a VC, you have to tell everything that's kind of over. Now it's like a high net worth individual. And I'll tell that person, uh, they don't maybe don't want to sign an NDA either, but I'm less concerned they're going to steal the idea. So what I would say is this has to be thought of up front and you have to say, look, depends on the advice. Some of them are so tight with the IP they're going to have or do have that I'm not concerned. Some are the other way, like take coronary catheters. Everything you can think of before we even had the materials or the technology to make it has been patented. So it's very difficult to get a patent on something like a catheter, but you can get um, knowledge, manufacturing, individual knowledge, use patents. So this whole piece is not easy to answer. It's very case specific. In general, I do NDAs. Okay. Um, so, Sai, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, hey, uh, this is a um, pretty good level of detail of uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, question Sai, can you the... tell us, can, Sai, can you just tell us who you are and where you are? Oh, yeah. So this is uh, Sai Gonogutla. I'm based in Houston. Uh, we are... are you at... uh, are you a healthcare professional or a non-healthcare professional? Oh, well, uh, we are an engineering firm that develops medical devices. Uh, okay, and so what is your question? Yeah, qu question on the device investment, right? So you mentioned early on, so this is uh, kind of um, the trend that we've been seeing as well, uh, but more uh, uh, digging down, is it in terms of dollars of invested, or the 5% that you mentioned, is that in terms of dollars invested, or is it in terms of uh, number of investments. Dollars. Oh, dollars. By okay. investment dollars. Okay. Brian. Uh, if you have a development firm, anyone on the call that does or watches this video, um, I have a nice list of people that do that work. I have some go-tos. Um, Nagel Writer in Florida is a great example, but I'm always on the hunt for more. Why? Because to me, I want the firm that has not just great engineers, not just great quality system, great engineers with 20 years making what I'm trying to make. So I'm always on the hunt for, for new ones. Yeah, I would, I, would, uh, I would like to reach out to you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, so we, we are we're a full uh, process uh, development uh, company, right? So, we, I mean, we don't do anything on the regulatory side, but we do the prototype, design, modeling, simulation, development, as well as uh, uh, regulatory testing side of it, but not clinical testing. So clinical is outside, right? Uh, so thank you, appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, John, did you want to ask John Crombie? Did you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, I did. So just so you know, I'm a former industry person, a lot of patents and products on the market. Who five years ago left the industry, started my own company. So I'm doing the same thing, working with physicians. Here's a question I have now that I have physician clients and even still physician companies, they have a difficulty recognizing user needs. Now, for instance, what you just said, you talk to a doctor, you're telling him what he's doing. You, It's very clear and obvious. It's different than what he's talking about. A lot of clinicians, uh, besides saying, I want it cheaper, faster, they don't know how to recognize their own deficiencies because they struggle with everything and learn to overcome it. So they could be struggling with something and it's like, oh no, this is how I do it. And you're looking at it like, that's insane. Like, why are you doing so much trouble? So my point is, how can, and this is for clinicians and I'm trying to get into their head. Yeah. They understand the difficulties and the value of what they have overcome. How do they capture that? Because that's, that's, the, that's the gold. So let me just take a crack at that. Um, I think that what the, the value proposition to the doctor, I characterize as something called a quilt, Q-W-I-L-T. So when you say, well, what does a doctor want? I don't care whether it's a digital health device or a med tech device or a drug or whatever. What's the value? What, is the, what are the jobs, pains, and gains the doctor wants you to do? And when I say doctor, I mean healthcare professional, dentist, whatever. 
So I, I sort of made up this little ac acronym that's quilt. So they, they, they want you to uh, deliver a product that they believe, rightly or wrongly, will improve the quality of care. It, it may actually not improve the quality, but that's what they believe. So they want to believe that whatever you're going to do is going to improve the quality of care. That's the Q. The W is, I don't want you to mess with my workflow. And, and Brian mentioned this. If this is going to take more time, more effort, steep learning curve, lots of hassle, administrivia, I don't have anything to do with it. I want you to allow me to do what I do now better, but I don't want you to screw up my workflow. The third is the I, which is income. What's in it for me? How am I going to make money doing this? Do I get Medicare reimbursement extra because I get brownie points for doing it? Do I get paid more for doing it? And it doesn't have to necessarily be money. It could be some intangible reward, but generally it's money. I mean, probably the single motivator is self-interest. That goes back to Adam Smith. I mean, we're not talking anything new. Yeah. So yeah. Q, quality, workflow, income. The L is liability. Do not expose me to more malpractice risk or increase my malpractice premiums, which incidentally are growing up for the first time in over 15 to 20 years. I have my own hunch about why that's happening, but in several states, malpractice premiums are going up. And I'm, like I said, we can talk about that some other time. Finally, the last one is the T. Give me something that will allow me to spend more time with my patient. I don't necessarily want to see more patients because the company and the hospital that I'm working for already has me booked to see 40 patients a day. The last thing in the world I want is to see more patients because I'm salaried. So I want to be able to, to spend more time with an individual patient. And depending on the numbers, it's anywhere from the average visits 12 to 15. I mean, you pick a number, but it's not very long. And oh, by the way, 20% of that is typing into a computer. So make it so that I can spend more time face, talking to the patient. These days it's virtual, probably gonna go back to face-to-face, -to -face. it'll be hybrid, whatever, but just give me more time for the patient. So those are the kinds of things I would like to see. Now, more specifically to your question, I don't know what I don't know. I'm so used to doing things the way I've done it for 40 years that I, I have these blind spots. I don't know what could be made better. So how do you do that? Well, actually you're familiar with biodesign programs. The number, so the bottom line is ethnographic research. So biodesign programs take engineers like yourselves who are in graduate school. And I work with these folks because we have a this similar program in Colorado and they put the engineers into the clinical setting so that they can watch, just like Brian's story in a cath lab, they can watch people do stuff. And they may not, and they may come up with, well, why are you doing it the way, have you ever thought of X? It's like the IDEO shopping cart exercise. So you go into the situation now, Getting there is another story because as we all know, getting into a patient or a clinical facility, there are a lot more barriers than there used to be. The reps used to be all over the place. Yeah. People could show a card, they make pizza and you get into the whole one. Well, that doesn't happen. So it's tough to kind of get in there, but that's one suggestion. Now, and, the, and finally, um, you have to find, so if you can't do that, you have to identify healthcare providers with an entrepreneurial mindset. In other words, they're innovators and early adapters. Your challenge is to cross the chasm. That's what we're talking about. But to start, and you start with the problem, not with the solution. So you find someone who is open-minded enough and has a growth mindset and an entrepreneurial mindset to give you some ideas and is open to new suggestions and work with you in a pilot, and, and all of this takes time. It's easier said than done. None of this is easy. And we can get into the weeds on how to do it, but, but those are just some high level suggestions. So we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so Jay, did you want to ask your question? Uh, Jay Schiff? Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Like, um, so that actually, that last answer, I, I really like this quilt thing that you described. It, it really resonated with me and my comp for my company. Um, but you mentioned about. Jay, let know, me just interrupt, interrupt you. Could you introduce yourself? And oh, I'm sorry. Jay Schiff, I'm co founder and CEO of Adenex Technologies. Um, and we are um, a, a company that's uh, got a patent and is doing a clinical study on a dispensing system for risky drugs like opioids. Uh, okay. And so uh, I've been actually thinking about um, contacting, but I haven't yet, malpractice insurers with the idea that you're talking about, not that will it increase, will, will using our system increase liability, but actually would it decrease their liability? And would, they, right. would those um, malpractice insurers be willing to support us in some way to help incentivize doctors? Um, and I'm curious right. whether the other of you have had experience dealing with them at all because everybody that I've spoken and I, I don't have a healthcare background um, so everything is relatively new to me um, I come from the finance world but you know I, I, it, I really don't run into people um, who have really gone through that channel um, and I'm curious if you have and you have any advice in that world yes so I have and the, ex the example is that the, the first of all there's lots and lots of malpractice carriers. You have to learn, you have to understand the malpractice ecosystem throughout the United States. There are private carriers and there are centralized carriers. So an example of a centralized carrier would be something called COPIC, C-O-P-I-C, which is the state of Colorado medical malpractice carrier. And the way that works, and, and they're not the only one. I mean, you can get malpractice insurance through other private carriers, but the advantage is that the Colorado Medical Society did a deal with COPIC so that if you join the Colorado Medical Society, you will get a discount on COPIC insurance. So it's a no brainer. You, you join the Colorado Medical Society and whatever the dues were, it offset the discount on the malpractice insurance. So now you have malpractice insurance through COPIC. And, there's, and we can talk till the cows come home about Matt, but to your point, um, if you do certain things, there are standards, there are guidelines, and obviously opioid addiction is a big deal. So if you do this, if you recommend that, if you comply with the standard, if you participate in the drug monitoring program, if you take this seminar, workshop, learning module, whatever, then we're going to give you X percent reduction in your malpractice. So the model is pretty well established, actually. Okay, great. And so it's a good stakeholder to talk to, and it gets to Brian's point of, and it wasn't actually included in the slide, but to talk, well, what are the malpractice implications of whatever you're trying to sell me? Because at, particularly in digital health, particularly in AI, we're going to see a lot of lawsuits, in my opinion, from the misapplication of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And guess what? If that is not included in your malpractice coverage, you're screwed. So you, you, you have, and it's all evolving. Nobody really knows what is the standard of care for AI because malpractice is all about duty, breach, causation, and damages. So what, what is your duty as a physician to comply with a standard of care in AI? We don't know that. And everybody's trying to figure it out. And we eventually will. But my guess is this is America and things change when people get sued. So that's, that's why I included the, the liability. And frankly, I think it's, it's, it's something that is not addressed enough from the perspective of the med tech developer, because you need to understand, I'm not going to do it if I'm going to, if it's too risky. I mean, why should I do it? So it's just not worth it. Yeah, that's why it resonated with me because I don't hear anybody talk about it, um, but it's something I've been thinking about for a while now. Thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Quick question. Um, um, so what would be a good way to get in contact with uh, Brian? Right. So Brian, what's the best way to, for people to get in touch with you? Well, the best would be email. And yeah. it's just my first initial B, last name spelling Doty, B Doty. That's B as in Brian. D-O-U-G-H-T-Y at DeltaForceUSA.com. All right, so I'm going to put that in the chat. DeltaForceUSA.com. Right. And All if right. you go to the Dodi website, you can 
see my uh, information there as well. And there it is, you got okay. it perfect, Arlen. Okay, so we need to quit. Um, I really appreciate uh, all the insight, Brian. We'll see you next week for uh, chapter two of this journey. We appreciate all the folks that have signed in. Uh, I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm the president and CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. If you're interested in more about what we're doing, go to www.soapnet.org. Um, and uh, join us for more things like that. And uh, we'll be uploading this video to our SOAP YouTube channel. So uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to review this or see more. So thanks very much and uh, stay safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you.